Um, I hope everyone has their coffee and is ready to uh, listen to my talk. And um, I really want to just kind of discuss this review that we wrote um, a few months ago where we were looking at, we were actually asked to, to write a review on genetics of sleep disorders. And um, I'm actually kind of from this world of genetics of neurodevelopmental disorders and kind of fell into sleep when I started realizing how many kids with neurodevelopmental disorders also have sleep problems. And since I'm a geneticist, I was interested in the underlying genetic mechanisms, and I started noticing that there were quite a few mechanisms that were being implicated in sleep traits that are also implicated kind of independently in other neurological diseases. And so I kind of spun this review um, without Lancet's permission to look more at this pleiotropy and um, the overlap and um, they actually ended up buying it and thinking it was interesting so that's why uh, I'm going to get to be able to talk to you today about this review so I just want to start by um, figuring out how to get my slides going okay so I want to start by talking about just why we care about sleep in general um, so sleep is actually one of these health issues that isn't really recognized um, in our modern society. And this is just a plot from um, a recent CDC um, prevalence estimate of how many people in the U.S. sleep less than six hours per night. Um, and this is showing you by age group and the percentage of people and you're also seeing the difference between what was observed in 1985 and what's being observed in 2004. And so you're seeing that there's an increase in the number of individuals who are sleeping less than six hours a night. And just as an aside, um, the American um, Society for Sleep Medicine recommends that if you want to maintain optimal health that you should sleep at least seven hours a night at least most people should and so the reason that we care about people sleeping six or less is that because sleep duration is associated with obesity um, so for example in this graph you're seeing that it's not even just shorter sleep that's being associated with higher BMIs it's actually kind of a um, a curved relationship. So you kind of want to have be in this optimal range where you're sleeping between seven and eight hours a night. Cause then when you do start sleeping more, you're also seeing higher rates of BMI. It's also associated with diabetes and, um, impaired glucose tolerance. And this is actually a graph that's adjusted for all of the environmental factors that are influencing diabetes other than sleep duration and showing the importance of um, how short sleep, which so here you're seeing six hours, here you're seeing what's optimal, and here you're seeing less than five hours and you see this very increased odds of um, having diabetes given that you sleep less than five hours a night. It's also associated with increased rates of mortality. This is another kind of curved uh, plot. So you're seeing that your risk of mortality is actually increasing with shorter hours of sleep. And then here's your optimal range. And then the more you sleep, it's also being increased again. And then sleep problems are common and they're, they're more common in individuals who have dementia, cognitive impairment, neurodegenerative diseases, epilepsy, stroke, depression, and neurodevelopmental disorders. So one of the reasons that I'm interested in understanding pleiotropy and pleiotropic effects is not just because these traits um, have overlapped sleep traits and sleep disorders, the genetics seem to be similar to the genetics that are being implicated in these other clinically distinct conditions, but that it's my, most people do have more than one condition. It's very rare that you see someone in the clinic who only has um, one disorder or um, just a sleep problem and not another issue like hypertension. Um, and so characterizing this pleiotropy may help kind of get to this goal of 
what we have in the US, which is um, this vision of precision medicine and how we might be able to use genetic information to better understand the optimal treatments for individuals who have multiple conditions. So just a very simple definition of pyotropy and what I mean when I'm saying pyotropy because there's many ways you can define this, but it's really just that there's one genetic variant that's influencing two different phenotypes. And actually this is not as simple as that in the sense that this is a plot of the succinase dehydrogenase gene, which encodes complex two of the mitochondria. And it's actually just showing you not just how many different disorders are associated with dysfunction in that gene, but how all of those disorders uh, connect to each other. This is actually a really cool software program down here at the bottom where you can input your gene and if it's an OMIM, it'll plot for you how many different disorders it has been implicated in and also all of the connections across those disorders as far as like when they have common symptoms. And so this is just, that was one gene. This is like a snapshot of um, the current GWAS catalog. So you can see there's pretty much no GWAS hits that are only associated with one disorder. So it seems like this is a very broad phenomenon. And um, I kind of mentioned already, but again, I'll just drive in this idea of how we can use this in personalized medicine. So um, Peter Vischer actually recently did um, meta-analysis of GWAS data for 42 complex traits and observed that there's hundreds of loci that are result, um, associated with multiple traits. Most individuals that we see in the clinic do present with more than one disease. And um, something very interesting that was observed by Peter Vischer's group is that some variants associate with risk for one disease, but they might actually be protective for another disease. So it kind of makes identifying these drug targets tricky. Um, and there's numerous examples in sleep and neurological disease. So I'm gonna go on and move into that. So I'm gonna talk quickly about the various disorders that I did in this review. And um, one I'm gonna talk about is kind of related to this well-known um, genetically encoded molecular oscillator that encodes the clock, the core clock. And this is what regulates our sleep-wake cycle. Um, this is a very simplistic view of it. There, it involves many genes and all of these genes regulate expression of hundreds of other genes. Um, and it's still kind of trying to be worked out, but as far as what we know, this um, clock and BMAL, these two genes encode proteins that when they um, heterodimerize, they activate transcription of the period gene and the cryptochrome gene. And then these two genes heterodimerize. And they're either, they're kind of regulated by kinases and phosphatases. Um, casein kinase delta and epsilon are the two kinases that we know phosphorylate per and cry. Once they're phosphorylated, they either are degraded by um, ubiquitins or they move into the nucleus where they then function to inhibit the clock BMAL transcription. So it's kind of this um, autoregulatory feedback loop where the um, positive arm of the loop is encoded by clock and BMAL and that activates per and cry and then per and cry come back and negatively regulate clock and BMAL. So there are two really well-known disorders for circadian rhythm disorders. So there's advanced sleep phase and delayed sleep phase. And I'm just highlighting for you here the genes that we have some pretty strong evidence are being implicated in advanced sleep phase disorders. And then, um, so this is actually PER2, and then PER3 seems to be, um, there's three PERs. Um, there's PER3 seems to be implicated in delayed sleep phase, and then clock has some level of implication in delayed sleep phase disorder. So then chronotype is actually the behavioral manifestation of our molecular clocks. So it's when we 
think or when we feel that we want to go to sleep and wake up pretty simply. So but why we care about understanding chronotype genetics is not just because we know that there's this core clock that's encoded by genes, but that it's been shown in numerous studies that when sleep and wake aren't coordinated with your internal circadian rhythm, there's negative effects on health. And this is most profound in shift work. Um, so it's actually for someone who might have delayed sleep phase disorder, it'd be actually beneficial to work the night shift because you're gonna be sleeping in time with your circadian clock. Um, and so if you're somebody who has advanced sleep phase or um, a normal rhythm, you might have some very negative consequences to your health, including obesity, diabetes, um, heart disease, et cetera, that occur because you work a night shift. Um, and so there were three really big GWAS that were conducted. So these were done using 23andMe data. Um, and then there were two studies that used the UK Biobank. They just used um, some level of overlapping samples and um, one was published just a little bit later and so had a bigger sample size because the UK Biobank is continually releasing data. Um, so really what was done was they did GWAS of self-reported chronotype, which is not really a perfect phenotype, um, but it's basically whether you subjectively think that you're a morning person or an evening person. Um, there is actigraphy data in the UK Biobank that is currently being clean and um, will be starting to be analyzed soon, which is a probably um, a more refined phenotype for chronotype because it's an objective measurement as opposed to some of the biases that can be contributed to self-report. But regardless, since the sample sizes were so big in these studies, they did find genome-wide significant associations. And what was really found overall is that it seems like there's a lot of different genes that each contribute a small effect individually to expression of chronotype. So these are the overlap of results from the chronotype GWAS. Um, based on this study, which kind of conditioned on these other studies findings, it seems like there's 22 independent loci that are associated with self-report of being morning or evening person. And I wanted to point out that this study here, which is um, by Jacqueline Lane, they actually observe stronger odds ratios indicating larger effects for some variants when they were analyzing the extremes. So this is a self-reported question and it's really like a four multiple choice answer. So you can say you're definitely a morning person, you're more morning than evening, you're more e evening than morning, or you're definitely evening. And so it reduced the sample size for analysis, but when they focused on people who reported definitely morning versus definitely evening versus everyone kind of in the middle, um, they did see these stronger effects. And then they also conducted um, some functional studies, functional aggregate analyses, and they identified that many of the mechanisms that were being implicated by the associated uh, variants were related to central nervous system function. Um, so of note, these genes here in the middle overlapped in every um, data set analysis. This top gene is actually regulated by hypocretin, and hypocretin is the neurotransmitter that promotes wakefulness. This gene was exclusive expression in the brain. This gene um, actually is um, ubiquitinates and mediates degradation of the cryptochrome gene, which, if you remember from the previous plot, is one of the core components of the clock, and it relates to extended circadian periods. HER2 is another core clock component. And then this gene, um, actually, when they knocked it out of mice, they also saw a longer circadian period. So that's just showing that there's a lot of functional evidence backing up these genes being implicated in chronotype in humans. And this is, I'm, I, so 
in the paper, you'll you see like a full ideogram plot of all of the um, various genes that are implicated by um, ev in every sleep trait that's talked about in the review, uh, as well as all of the neurological diseases where these same genes are implicated. But for this purposes of this, I've kind of tried to simplify it a little bit and focus on each disorder individually as far as sleep goes. Um, but I'm highlighting for you here anything that was implicated in a circadian rhythm related phenotype and all of the um, overlap with other neurological diseases. So these three genes in particular were the genes that came out of all three GWAS. And so you can see this um, APH1A gene and that it's being implicated in not just chronotype, but also in Alzheimer's disease. Um, this one's chronotype Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. And then PER2 is actually implicated in um, chronotype and in um, the, it's in the um, advanced sleep phase disorder and also in neurodegenerative disease. So then moving into normal sleep. So the next section talks about um, sleep EEG, and that's how we try to objectively measure sleep. Um, so the prevalence of normal sleep is 100% in the human population, because all of us sleep, or at least hopefully. Um, it's actually conserved across almost all species, which points to why sleep is probably very important for the organism. Because if you think about an evolutionary trait, it wouldn't necessarily be beneficial to an organism that has to escape from predators, for example, for them to sleep because you're in this state where you can't really respond to your environment. Um, so the fact that every single species that we've looked in seems to sleep, and that goes all the way down to C. elegans, um, up to humans, and there's actually even evidence in like dolphins that they sleep, but they put half their brain to sleep at a time. Um, uh, they don't necessarily have REM, non, or sorry, REM sleep that we have been able to measure, but still, you know, they're in an environment where they're constantly being um, under the threat of predators, and they've managed to evolve a mechanism where they can give their brain time to sleep without going completely asleep. Um, however, it is extremely variable, so it's hard to measure um, because there's inner individual variability and there's a lot of variability across individuals. But we have seen in humans, and this is also pretty much conserved across all the species where we've looked at sleep ontogeny, that during our early stages of development, organism development, we sleep for longer periods and that gradually decreases over time. So there are heritable sleep traits. EEG is the objective measures of sleep, which I'll talk about next. And then there's the amount of time it takes you to fall asleep, how long you sleep, and how efficient your sleep is. And that kind of relates to um, how much slow wave sleep you get. It's what we would think of as the more restorative sleep. And it's also influenced um, another issue with trying to measure this phenotype. It's influenced by a number of extrinsic factors, especially here in um, like the U.S. and a lot of modern society where we have a lot of um, uh, unnatural light sources. Um, we have devices that we're constantly on. There's actually been studies of populations that still live in more rural communities with less artificial light um, and sh trying to understand their sleep patterns um, and how the consequences of our sleep patterns not being what they should be as far as the way our species evolved to have them um, have health consequences. And there's a study, there's a group in Colorado that actually is doing research where they send people into the woods to camp for a weekend. And they show that just a couple of days without an artificial light source resets your circadian clock and allows you to sleep in time with your rhythm. So this is the genetics of sleep EEG, and this is from the appendix of this review. Um, I'm just trying to, I've, 
indicated what the evidence for each gene is, what that gene is involved in. And um, I'm trying to kind of just like define for you what this means as far as what the sleep EEG is showing us. So people with a long variant of a promoter polymorphism in PER3 have increased sleep drive, which is um, designated by this increase in slow wave sleep. Um, and I'm also showing you down here the various stages and what they look like on the EEG. So this is non-REM sleep, and these are what we call theta waves. This is um, the second stage of non-REM sleep, so N2. And this includes these sleep spindles and K complexes. And the sleep spindles are what um, they're calling the um, sigma waves. And then these are delta waves and that's indicating slow wave sleep and then REM sleep, which is the rapid eye movement sleep and when we're dreaming. Um, so individuals with HER2 mutations, um, it seems that they have less restorative sleep, so they have less slow wave sleep. I've indicated this in bold because one of the, there's various hypotheses about why we sleep. So we know sleep's important because of the conservation across species and the fact that um, almost every organism that it's been measured in does it. So we do think it does something important for the brain, especially when we see all these negative health consequences coming out of not sleeping. Uh, one of the reasons that people think that we sleep is to um, allow our brains time to maintain synaptic function and synaptic plasticity and um, a balance of excitatory versus inhibitory synaptic transmission, which is called synaptic homeostasis. So it's interesting that this brain-derived neurotrophic factor gene is implicated in reduced slow wave sleep theta and alpha activity, and that would indicate less restorative sleep, and that that gene is um, expected to function in synapse function. Um, this is the melatonin uh, receptor encoding gene, and its mutations in this gene have been found to be associated with increased um, time to move into REM sleep. Uh, this DEC2 gene, rare variants have been identified and um, it's been observed that these are found in individuals with a reduced need for sleep. So they actually sleep less than six hours a night, but don't actually don't see any observed negative consequences of that. So it may actually be a protective effect. And then, then the adenosine uh, dehydrogenase uh, gene is actually controlling adenosine levels and it's been associated with an elevated need to sleep. So these are the pleiotropic effects of the various genes that have been implicated in sleep EEG and other neurological diseases. And then um, we're interested in primary insomnia and um, so insomnia in itself is kind of difficult to define for genetic studies. It's got a pretty common rate in the population. It tends to be higher in females. Um, there is some level of heritability, and those estimates just kind of depend on what phenotype that you're saying is a proxy for insomnia. Um, but it's a pretty noisy phenotype. It's mostly measured with self-report. Um, it's hard to get EEG measurements on somebody with insomnia because if you don't sleep, you can't actually measure the stages of sleep and various things with polysomnography. Um, there's a lot of extrinsic influences. There are some related traits that we can look at a little more reliably than um, just reports of insomnia. And that includes sleep duration and then response to sleep loss. So those seem to be kind of um, traits that are related to insomnia. And then there's evidence for gene environment interaction. So there's evidence that um, there's people with some PER3 mutations have alcohol induced insomnia. And then people with mutations in the adenosine deaminase gene um, can actually have caffeine induced insomnia. So this is an overview of all the genes that have been implicated in either sleep duration or response to sleep loss, which is just one asterisk 
or in insomnia measured by symptoms of insomnia. These are pretty much all self-reported measures of insomnia. Um, and again, I'm indicating for you in bold and italics a function of sleep, a suspected function of sleep, which is synapse formation. So this gene is involved in synapse formation. It's associated with um, having problems with insomnia. And we think that a function of sleep is to um, help with synapse formation. And the other um, suspected function of sleep is memory consolidation. And this gene, again, is implicated in sleep duration. And it's also observed to be involved in memory consolidation. And then this gene is, again, implicated in sleep duration and is also involved in energy production. And that's another suspected function of sleep. So there's probably multiple reasons that we sleep. And it's probably depends on where in the brain you're looking, what neuronal system, what stage of sleep that you're looking at. But throughout the course of um, our sleep pattern, there's going to be these various processes that are going on to help us uh, maintain balances of synapses, especially during early stages of development, consolidate our memories, um, and uh, help with um, energy restoration. So if we're expending all this energy during the day, then sleep is what's helping to build up more energy stores again for the next day. And these are pleiotropic genetic effects in insomnia and neurological disease. And here I'm just using insomnia to, to indicate all of those insomnia-related phenotypes that I just talked about. And I wanted to just note that this plot is actually updated from the uh, review because uh, Jacqueline Lane again um, did another UK Biobank GWAS where she looked at um, a question that was asking people about insomnia symptoms, so self-reported insomnia symptoms, and um, also looked at sleep duration. Okay, so then moving into specific sleep disorders. So there are two neurological sleep disorders, restless leg syndrome and narcolepsy, with very strong evidence for genetic influences. So restless leg syndrome is characterized by unpleasant sensations in the legs during rest. And um, one of the things that's noted is that the individual getting up from bed and walking relieves these unpleasant sensations. So you can imagine how that would disrupt your sleep. Um, it's, there's population prevalence is kind of varying just depending on um, what study you look at, but it can be anywhere from 2.5% to 10% of the population have this. Um, there's evidence for heritability. There's evidence for familial aggregation. It seems like it's um, in an autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance. Um, there have been linkage regions identified that was th what was first looked at. Um, these regions were then fine mapped and they found common and rare variants associated. Um, there have been GWAS done successfully on RLS. And um, Along with what is being observed in the clinic and what we're observing through the genetic studies, there's evidence for the involvement of iron deficiency in RLS, um, issues with dopaminergic transmission, and mechanisms involved in organism development. So these are the genes that have been strongly implicated in RLS. And you can see that most of them are involved in organism development. Um, and this is just like the varied way that they're measuring RLS. So this in particular, this BTBD9 gene is increased RLS risk and reduced iron levels. And these are the pleiotropic effects in neurological disease. Um, and you notice like, for example, um, this gene, which is actually attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, is also associated with this gene. And RLS is actually often misdiagnosed as ADHD, which is kind of interesting. And um, Tourette's syndrome also is connected with RLS in that um, this gene that has been implicated in both disorders has been shown that when you knock it down, 
in flies, um, specifically in dopaminergic neurons, it, the result is fragmented sleep. And dopamine agonists were shown to rescue that effect, and they're also shown to be effective in treating Tourette syndrome. So narcolepsy is um, characterized by excessive sleepiness, and usually that comes along with cataplexy, which is bilateral loss of muscle tone. Um, so it's just an example of what someone with narcolepsy, what might happen to them if they were just eating dinner and just all of a sudden had cataplexy and fell asleep at the table. Um, it's also kind of interesting that there's narcoleptic uh, models in dogs, which is really cute actually. So if you can go, you can go online and you can look for, for narcoleptic dogs and you can watch when they get really excited to play with each other, they actually just completely collapse and um, fall asleep. So it's actually not as prevalent as some of the other disorders. Um, however, it's often misdiagnosed. Um, and it may just seem like someone is unusually sleepy. Um, it's interesting, too, that narcolepsy can often come along with um, a comorbid diagnosis of insomnia, which it seems kind of counter counterintuitive. Um, the pathology that is known is that it seems to be a loss of hypocretin neurons. So if you remember from um, a couple slides ago, hypocretin is the wake promoting neurotransmitter. So um, they have shown that orexin or hypocretin gene therapy is effective in um, improving narcolepsy in mice. However, um, lots of people look to see if it was actually the gene that encodes the hypocretin receptor that was um, associated with narcolepsy and they weren't finding any evidence of that. So even though it's this loss of hypocretin, it's not necessarily um, dysfunction in the gene. It actually seems like based on what the genetic findings have shown so far that it's actually an autoimmune disease and it's autoimmune mediated destruction of these hypocretin containing neurons. And the, um, the gene actually with the most evidence for being involved in risk for narcolepsy is encoding the major histocompatibility complex, and that's HLA. So this is again showing you all of the genes. Um, this is one of the appendix tables that are implicated in narcolepsy, and again you're seeing just like time after time after time it's a gene that seems to be involved in um, function of the immune system. And this is the overlap with narcolepsy genes and genes that are implicated in other neurological disease. Um, not surprisingly, we've got HLA, which I, I've made bigger because it has what we know so far as the strongest effects. And you notice that multiple sclerosis and other demyelinating diseases are popping up. Um, and that may have something to do with this um, these, gene, these diseases are also autoimmune diseases. Okay, so then these are the other sleep disorders we looked at. And um, I have to be honest, we added this because the, because Lanta asked us to, and the reviewers asked us to. We weren't necessarily going to talk about them because um, they're kind of rare. But I do think it was interesting that we were specifically requested to do this because these are all disorders that have very well-known genetic causes. So um, this is actually autosomal dominant nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy. Um, so it's when you have seizures, but only during sleep. Um, and then there's others, there's familial sleepwalking and other um, parasomnias is what they're called. And it's kind of these um, sleepwalking, sleep talking, um, confusional arousals, having sleep terrors. Um, and then here's a couple more in the um, nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsies. So that's probably the best characterized um, it seems like these various mutations in the, all of these different genes um, do have um, causal effects. So it's not multiple genes contributing small effects, but just one single mutation in the gene causes the disorder. And again, 
we're seeing evidence for involvement of synaptic transmission um, that is a suspected function of sleep. And this is the pleiotropic genetic effects between these other sleep disorder disorders and neurological disease. And you see epilepsy popping up a lot. Um, not surprisingly, infantile seizures. Um, and then also memory deficits, neurodegenerative diseases, um, multiple sclerosis. And I think that's just because AHLA has kind of been implicated again. Um, addiction, which was actually susceptibility to alcohol, or sorry, tobacco addiction. And then, so this is actually figure three from the review. And what I wanted to try to show with this figure, so this is the protein-protein interaction network. So for all of the genes that have been implicated in the various sleep traits and disorders that were talked about in the review, if you look for the encoded proteins and how they um, interact with each other. Some of them don't have any evidence of interaction, but there's a large number of these proteins that can be coalesced into one overall network um, just based on their, their direct connections or maybe a secondary connection with a connector gene here. And so, these are, sorry, so this is just giving you like the color coding on the plot. So it's telling you things that were associated with the various sleep disorders that we looked at, and then some that were associated with more than one sleep disorder. So for the last little bit, I'm going to talk about why um, I think characterizing pleiotropy is useful, and also not just of pleiotropy of a single gene, but looking at these overall mechanisms and like broader network connections. So this kind of is near and dear to my heart and what most of my research focuses on is trying to understand the connection between autism and sleep. So insomnia is very common in children with autism. Um, estimates range from 50 to 80% of kids with autism have issues falling asleep or staying asleep. Um, we have a lot of evidence indicating that sleep is important for proper brain development. And so when children with autism don't sleep, this may have negative long-term effects on their neurological function. And we do know that lack of sleep worsens autism-related symptoms during the day. It's probably a vicious cycle where the child has severe symptoms of autism that are contributing to sleep problems. And then those, when the child has sleep problems, that makes their autism symptoms worse. And so it just keeps perpetuating the cycle. Um, but we do think that genetic information based on some overlapping mechanisms that have been implicated between insomnia and autism may be useful to helping inform treatment for insomnia in these kids. So here's this um, evidence for synaptic homeostasis in autism. So defects in synaptic pruning have been implicated in autism. So here's a plot showing um, these are individuals with autism and their spine density, and then um, the synaptic spine density, and these are controls um, of comparable ages and their spine densities. And so you see this increase in the number of spines in the individuals with autism. This is in the temporal lobe, indicating that they're having issues with um, not enough synaptic pruning. And then sleep is evidence to be critical for controlling this balance. And so this is um, evidence supporting what is called the shy hypothesis of sleep, which is synaptic homeostasis hypothesis, indicating that there's this net loss in synaptic spines during the sleep period. Um, this is evidence from one of my collaborators that's actually showing that it really depends on what stage of sleep and where in the brain you're looking. In REM sleep, for example, that seems to be where um, firing rates are decreased, whereas in non-REM they seem to be increasing. So this is evidence that maybe we, we're building during non-REM sleep and we're pruning during REM sleep. And there is actually some studies that have shown that it's not just insomnia and autism, but it's shorter periods of REM sleep, which would kind of drive this connection. If they're not pruning appropriately um, as a consequence of the issues they have causing the autism, and then they're not having enough REM sleep and 
REM sleep is where we're pruning synapses. That could be an underlying mechanism that is causing these more severe um, symptoms in individuals with autism and insomnia. Um, Olivia, I want to stand this one question. Yeah. So the last three figures you showed, um, um, what organism is this? Is this human or is this animal models? Um, this is human and this is mice. Um, and the left, how do you me measure the spines? So these were actually, um, I think these are post-mortem. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no problem. And then this is again, so this is also mice. Um, but this is actually interesting. So this is showing, so this is kind of a normalized value indicating, um, so they, they took mice and during what is comparable to an adolescent period in humans, they sleep restricted the mice for five days. And then they let them continue in their normal behavior. And then when they had entered mouse adulthood, they did projection fractions um, in different areas of the brain. And um, what this is indicating for you is any positive value of this K, this normalized value, is lower projection fractions for the mice that were sleep restricted for five days during adolescence. And then this is by brain regions. You see this kind of effect seems to be a little stronger in the thalamus and the hypothalamus. So mice who were sleep restricted during adolescence had reduced levels of connectivity in their adult brain. Um, so this is again mice, and I think there were only like 10 mice. It was kind of a small sample size and the results weren't statistically significant, but it's still kind of this trend toward the effect and kind of gets at this idea that there may be long-term consequences on neurological function if you are sleep restricted during early periods of life. And if you remember when we were talking about normal sleep, there's all the sleep ontogeny is happening such that we're sleeping for longer periods during early development. Um, these are, this is a map of all of the synaptic genes that have been implicated in autism. The other thing here, and kind of getting at this idea of we can potentially make an impact in precision medicine, is that the star is highlighting all, the, all of the genes that already have drug targets um, developed. And then this is just an insomnia-related protein network. So in yellow are all of the genes that have been implicated in insomnia, and this is updated with the new study from Jacqueline Lane. Um, and gray is just the connector genes. The blue are all the genes that have been also implicated in autism. And then the blue and green are the overlap. So the, all of these genes in green are implicated in insomnia and autism. So there's really only one gene from this network that's only implicated in autism. Some that have been implicated in insomnia. And some of these genes have like minimal evidence for being involved in autism. Um, so I don't know that we could say that they're an autism risk gene, but there is some evidence that maybe some individuals with autism is um, related to dysfunction in those genes. And when you do the panther analysis on all of the genes that have been implicated in insomnia, there's overrepresentation significantly for genes that are involved in synaptic transmission. So it's kind of like this whole pulling together this whole picture that sleep's important for um, syn maintaining synaptic balance and proper plasticity and transmission. And when you have dysfunction in genes that are involved in synaptic transmission, it's increasing risk for insomnia. Uh, so this, this is just another ideogram plot and I'm just showing you genes that have been implicated in insomnia and then in green are the genes that are also implicated in autism. And that's it. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was a very, very uh, detailed overview. <laughs> how, many, how many references do you have in the paper? Um, oh, they made me 
they had me stick to like a hundred. So you'll actually, there's 114. I convinced them to allow more. Um, I actually got around that barrier by adding an appendix reference list. So you'll see the paper has two bibliographies, ones for the main body of the text and then ones for the appendix section. And I, so throughout the review, I,